Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very, I tr very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of fl the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very tr truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has descended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every year, Trinity Sunday is the Sunday following Pentecost Sunday, which is the first Sunday in ordinary time. Ordinary time, it seems pretty commonplace, doesn't it? Because there's really nothing that's ordinary about coming to church, especially in these days of pandemic, when we haven't been able to gather together in the sanctuary. Ordinary time, though, means the time when the Spirit is moving among God's people. We read two weeks ago the ascension of our Lord, last week the coming of the Spirit, and today... We're trying to sort of hammer God into a box in a way, it seems, doesn't it, when we talk about the Trinity? Trinity, a word that never even appears in Scripture. There is no concept of the Trinity as we have come to call the doctrine now. Although Jesus, even though he didn't read it this year on Ascension Sunday, when he gives the Great Commission, he challenges the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, I didn't get the children's message here today. It was long and sort of convoluted, and I thought that's going to just make it worse. But I know that all around the country today, there are pastors who have ice and water and steam. Hard to bring to church. People will be there with the thermos or a cup of coffee with a lid on it to see the steam come out and say, the Holy Spirit is like steam. Jesus is that solid ice that you can touch. And God is like the water that fills us in the earth, but you can't hold on to it, can you? Now, that works a little bit because they're all the same. They're all H2O molecules in different forms. The trouble is that you can't really define God because God is all of those things at one time. So to say it any other way is what was called modalism, which was a heresy that could get your head whacked off in the early days of the church. That's how upset people would get about these doctrines and trying to describe God. But if you're going to describe God as water, then I think, I think it was Karl Barth. I could not find it for sure, but I think it was Karl Barth, the great theologian who wrote 13 chapters, 13 volumes, excuse me, of church dogmatics. When he was asked to sum up his theology in one sentence, he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But he wrote 13 volumes on that subject. But I'm pretty sure it was Karl Barth who said that trying to define God and to limit God's activity even by describing the Trinity, is the same as trying to hold the ocean in a cup. It can't be done. God is bigger than our understanding. So why then do we go into this thing called the Trinity and try to find a doctrine or a dogma to fit it? Why then do we set aside a Sunday to look at the Trinity? Why did St. Patrick take that shamrock? Not because he was from Ireland, because he saw those three leaves connected to one stem, and he said, this is who God is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit always together, but distinctly operating in our world. It's hard to understand the doctrine of the Trinity, and I don't want to belabor that anymore. I want us to look at the relationships we talked about in the story this morning. 
particularly the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a Pharisee. We're used to Pharisees coming to Jesus to trip him up, to trick him into saying something that they can use to condemn him with. But Nicodemus is going to Jesus under the, the cover of nightfall. He goes when it's dark, and he sits with Jesus, and he says, surely you must be from God. Who else could do things like this if he was not part of who God is? And Jesus says things that we don't quite understand. And we're always good at memorizing the 16th verse of the chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I always say we've got to take the 17th with the 16th. For God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. Jesus is saying you've got to be born of the spirit. You've got to be born again. I know Christians who run at the thought of being a born-again Christian. I know Christians who proudly say, I am a Christian, but I am not a born-again Christian. I'm not one of them. But how can we be a Christian unless we have had an experience of God that convicts us of our sin and convinces us of our salvation through the gift of grace, not through what we've done or what we've left undone, not through what we can hope to earn or what we can gain or what we can do right, but in spite of everything that we have done that falls short of the glory of God. That is who God is for us in Jesus Christ. And that is what Jesus is trying to explain to Nicodemus, who's confused. How can a grown man who's old enter a second time into his mother's womb? Well, if the idea of being born again is not so good to you, how about the idea of a reboot? Let's look at it that way. Why don't we? That's a modern, less than evangelical sort of concept. The reboot. I love computers, except when they're not so kind to me, but there's something great about a computer. It's, it's a, an undo button. You can click and undo what has just been done. Oh, if we could do that in our lives, wouldn't we live in a better world? We could unclick the pandemic and it would be done away with. We could say something hurtful to someone we love and hit undo and it would all be gone. We don't have that, do we? And even on a computer, there are some things that cannot be undone. And if I had a dollar for every time someone said to me, I hope you backed that up, and I said, no, I should have, but I didn't. But there's this wonderful thing you can do with a computer. You can boot a computer. That means to start it. That means to put it in the proper frame for doing what it's supposed to do. And then you can always reboot it. So what if we thought of ourselves as being rebooted through the Spirit into Jesus Christ? What if we thought of ourselves as going back to the place where our operation system is intact and in order and ready to go? What if it sets us up to do what we're supposed to do from the first place? Now there are reboots and there are hard reboots. The one where you take the battery out as well as unplug it from the wall and let it sit there before you start it up again. This is the hard reboot in Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying the flesh, the body that we have has been corrupted by sin but the Spirit can take us to a place where we are fit to serve. Just as in the days of King Isaiah when Isaiah was called. And Isaiah is there and he sees this unearthly sight. We can't even imagine that God's presence descends on the temple and Isaiah is there. And the hems of God's garment fill the whole temple. Which is saying God is bigger than we can imagine. God is like the ocean in a cup. It can't happen. God's spirit fills everything. And there are cherubim and seraphim, not happy-looking angels with wings, not pretty, beautiful angels in gowns and halos and giving off light, but winged creatures that are frightening to us. I always love how we call children's choirs cherub's choir, and that's kind of what they are. They're like little beasts with wings that sort of float around and terrorize people through their grandeur. And the holy, holy, holy that we sing on Trinity Sunday in that wonderful hymn that we started with, and we'll end the service with that, was not really a cry of anything other than how awesome and mysterious and wondrous and frightening the presence of God is in its fullness. Holy, holy, holy. That's the way they say it. To which Isaiah says, woe is me, because he realizes when confronted with all that grandeur, when confronted with the fullness of God and God's glory, how he has fallen short. Get away from me, Lord. So many of the faithful, when they're called in Scripture, say, no, Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. God says, I have something to do with that. I can fix that right away. And the seraph flies 
with tongs and brings a burning coal and touches his lips. Just as the fire of Pentecost did not burn, the fire does not burn his lips, but cleanses his speech. It's a reboot of sorts. And then God says to that heavenly council around God, the cherubim, the seraphim, the angels that we know that look like us, but who live with God and come to bring God's message. In that heavenly court, God says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah, Isaiah who is rebooted, Isaiah who's been born again through the living hope of his God says, here am I, send me. Ah, oh, the Trinity. I had to write a paper on the Trinity several times in seminary. I had to write that when I got to my ordination exams and explain how God comes to us in these three different ways. The doctrine of the Trinity, unfortunately, is something that keeps a lot of people from Christianity because they see it as three gods. It's not three gods. It's one God who acts in three different ways with us. That's why I asked Elaine to sing the song that she sang. One of my favorites, Wonderful and Merciful Savior, Counselor, Comforter, Keeper, Almighty, Infinite Father. God comes to us as a father because Jesus said, this is my father. And so through that, we are allowed to have access to God, the creator of all things, that fills all things. We can call God Father. We have the spirit present with God from the beginning, just as Jesus, the word of God, was present with God from the very beginning. We heard that in John's prologue. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. That word, that logos, Jesus Christ, present from the beginning. The spirit that moves across the waters and moves across the darkness and calls forth light. God is God. We can see God in different ways. We can experience God in different ways. But we have to open our hearts to that ability, to the spirit to come into us, as we read in Romans, that God's spirit will testify with our spirit. It's a lot to take in, isn't it? I hope that you can be like Isaiah that you can come into the grandeur of God's presence and understand that next to God we are so small. We may feel insignificant, but through the power of the Spirit we can be lifted up, we can be rebooted, we can be made new, we can be used for God's purpose. So I hope that when you hear the call, whom shall I send, who will go for us, that like Isaiah you will say, here am I, Lord, send me. Through the power of your Spirit, do all that you have equipped me to do and more than that. In Christ's most holy name, amen.